So I, I do want to be clear, this book does not exist. I'm pointing at the shared screen. If it's the wrong direction for you, I apologize. But this book does not exist. It's just literally so I can use the title effectively. Um, who am I? Why am I here? <clears throat> I used to look like that before lockdown affected my hair and years got to me, but I want to improve people's lives. That, that's the long, the short of everything else. Yeah, it's great to deliver value to customers. That's improving their lives too. But it's mainly about the people within the services. How can we help people have a better working life? Because we spend an awful lot of our time doing that work thing. Um, I happen to do those things. I am a coach, I am a teacher. Um, I am sometimes called Kanban Dan. It was a name that was bestowed upon me many years ago when I was working in a fashion company in Camden. I was introduced to a new coach as, here's Dan, he does Kanban. And a friend of, a very good friend of mine, Helen Meek, just looked at me and went, Kanban Dan, and gave me the eyes in that it was never going to be dropped. So I decided to adopt it. It has become a good marketing tool. I am shameless in that, but it makes me easy to find online. And my website, you'll never guess what, is kanbandan.com. I am an accredited Kanban trainer. That means I work with the Kanban University. In fact, I'm currently working, trying to uh, train up the next bunch of um, Kanban trainers right now in the Train the Trainer class this week and next. I am a professional scrum trainer. You can be both, it turns out. So professional Scrum Trainer is Scrum.org, rather than Scrum Alliance. I am also an IC Agile authorized instructor. So I can teach some Agile generic classes too. Um, so I'm trying to cover all the main bases for one reason and one reason only. I like doing introductory level Agile classes and Kanban classes, because I think people should go to those classes and come out with a wow moment and i keep meeting people who've come out gone to a class and gone nah. it's like no you didn't get it so i want to try and catch people early that's kind of why i'm going sort of wide and shallow with those things um i'm hoping you've all taken your brave pills today that was people putting their hands up because i was assuming you're in a physical room right um i would like you to get interactive the correct time for asking a question in this presentation is now, for any given definition of now throughout the thing. I'll try and even leave some spaces where people can unmute and get a word in. But if you've got a question, ask it when it's good for you, because it might be that other people also want to ask that question, but they haven't had their brave pill, so they didn't ask it yet. So I want to try and help people get some stuff from this. So Kanban and Scrum, let's break some things. Let's get back to the basics. I wanted to say that first. So Yas and I were having an interesting conversation at the start about professional Scrum Master 1 certification and Scrum Guide, and do you have to do all of Scrum or not all of Scrum, Scrum versus Agile, that whole thing. But if you are doing Scrum, it's about that. There is the 353, as we, recall, we refer them, the three roles, three artifacts, and five events. And you must do all of them, all 11 things to be doing Scrum. But this is what you're really trying to achieve. You're meant to get stuff done. The increment. The increment including all of the previous increments plus what we did this sprint to meet the sprint goal. That's the point of Scrum, right? Getting stuff done. Because if you're not getting stuff done, you're not getting feedback, and you're not getting any value. If you're not getting any feedback, the people who have asked you to do stuff aren't going to change their mind. And if the people aren't changing their mind, you're going to have fun when you're doing complex product delivery. And that's what Scrum's for. So I'm just going to put that out there. That's what Scrum's for. And Scrum's great at that. Provided you can have a team that does product delivery, that's what Scrum is absolutely in the wheelhouse for. It's really good at it. But the problem is we often try and force Scrum because Scrum is what everyone thinks of as Agile to start with. Typically, they think, oh, we're going to do Agile. Let's do Scrum. It seems to be an equal sign in most people's heads. Not quite sure why, but it's preeminent. So let's let's go with it. And they try and take it and say, let's take this large organization that's been going for, I don't know, 300 and odd years. 
and they've never done Scrum before, but now they're going to do Scrum, and it's just going to work like this. Ah, we have departments. Ah, we have dependencies. Ah, we have people who are engaged and people who aren't engaged. Oh, we seem to have set up the organization so that the senior managers are in competition with each other for the next promotion, which means instead of working well together, they have to work against each other in order to get promoted. Of course, that's a good idea, right? But that's how we are. And then we're going to put Scrum in there and it's magically going to make the world simpler. Yeah, you may have seen this experience too. It sometimes works. It works if you get the buy-in and to do it properly. But if you don't, if you end up with that scrumish kind of implementation, it can get very painful very quickly. I want to say this as well. Bigger isn't always better. Those are two population figures. I'm talking about England, not the United Kingdom. Roughly 56 million people in England. Um, roughly 5 million people in New Zealand. If you look at the stats for New Zealand versus England at rugby, which we invented, by the way, it's 33 to 8. How can this little country of 5 million people be consistently so much better at us than the game we invented when we have 10 times the population? We have the biggest union in the world. We have more rugby players in England than anywhere else. Japan's number two, by the way, which is interesting all by itself. But yeah, so it turns out there's something good about small as well. It's not always about big. Economy of scale works really well if you're doing shipping of containers on ships because you need half the power again to double the size of the boat. That's why economy of scale works on ships. Doesn't typically work with complex knowledge work. Have you ever, I'm assuming everyone here works in Agile teams. Is that a fair assumption? Give me a nod, a shake, or a thumbs up or something. Yeah. Uh, you'll have probably noticed this then. A group of great individuals doesn't magically make a great team. And actually, I think team is the most misused word in the workplace. Teams work together on things. They don't just sit together. They don't do the same thing as each other. They work together solving the same problem as each other. It, I noticed that in most football teams, the whole team plays with one ball. And they're trying to score a goal together and defend a goal together. They're all trying to do the same thing together. They're not working concurrently. They're working together. That's what I think of as team. And to carry that football metaphor, right? I think Manchester City, if you look at the players they've got on their books, you'd look one for one with virtually any other team in the world and think, yeah, I'd pick that one. Yet they don't win the league every year. And in fact, Leicester won it not that long ago. And they probably had three pretty good players compared to Manchester City. Three players that might have got in the team at Manchester City. But they won the league. How can that be? It turns out there's something special about teams. Japan at any Rugby World Cup, for example. You wouldn't pick any of their players, yet they beat South Africa. What's going on with that? Turns out teamwork... I'm trying not to say makes the dream work, but is something bigger. So I'm going to go into that. Similarly, a group of great teams does not magically make a great value flow. So if you have a single Scrum team, this is how Scrum is meant to work. Here is a customer, looks a bit like me in Lego form. Then there's a Scrum team. They do some stuff, and you get a done product increment. Happiness pervades the world. Everything happens in one team. Soup to nuts. It's cross-functional. It's multidisciplinary. Multi-skilled, multi-access. It's got DevOps going on and every other discipline you can imagine going on in the one team. We've got the props and the hookers and the back row forwards and the second rows all working in unison together. Everything you need to do one thing together. That's how Scrum's meant to work. However, what you see in large organization often looks a bit more like this. Here's a customer. They have a need. It goes through that team, that team, that team, that team, back to that team, through this team and into that team. Some of them are doing Scrum. Some of them are doing Scrum-ish. Some are doing nothing like Scrum. And eventually, you get this done increment, if you're lucky, eventually. And I do mean eventually. 
it can take forever because in that value flow, each team is working to their own set of priorities based on what the hippo in the room says, you know, the highest paid person's opinion. So they've got different product owners, they've got different agendas, different managers trying to achieve different things. And at the end of it, the customer eventually gets something. Great example, I worked at one of the big four banks recently. Uh, a bunch of people, two of them, spent two days writing and testing some software that would allow you to replace a broken debit card. Two days, end-to-end, -end. small piece of work. Took 18 months to go live. Improving the way those two people, part of one scrum team, did anything is not going to make a little bit of difference to the end customer. But they're the ones having the retrospective and looking to make things better. Isn't that interesting? So this is where the problem starts. And this is where we hit Scrum is a bit hard here, so we're going to do Kanban. And the amount of times I come across people, like, yeah, we tried Scrum, but Scrum was hard, so we're going to drop this, we're going to drop this, and now we call it Kanban. Because Kanban's an alternative to Scrum. Mm, let's not do that. So, Mentimeter time. Could you go to menti.com and put in that code? Let me go on to Menti2. That way you'll actually get the thing. You'll probably see a screen saying Scrum is from Mars, Kanban is from Venus. White screen. I'm not paying for Menti, so it's the super basic one. Okay. I am going to stop my screen share for the time being, and I'm going to share a different screen, which is going to move everything in Zoom, so I apologize ahead of time, so you can see what I see. Yep, that's right, it's moved to a different monitor entirely this time with Zoom. Okay, I'm hoping you've all managed to get there. Could you all just hit the heart, please, on the screen you're on? That way, oh, I can see at least 20 odd people. Fantastic, you're all there. Is anyone having any trouble? Or, or, or I assume you'd shout if you were? Okay, awesome. So let's go into question one. So this is a, it's a limited time quiz. So you're gonna answer this as quickly as you can. There's no time elements to the prize though. What is your background? Please type it in or click on one of the options. It's now I wish I hadn't set it to 60 seconds. <laughs> Maybe someone who's more of an expert in Menti than me can tell me if I can end that by just hitting it across. I'm going to try that. So I think I've got 37 answers. Oh, it's not showing me the answer. How can I get it? Make it show the answer. Ah, oh, there we go. One person got the question wrong. Who was that? I'm an alien, don't ask me. <laughs> it wasn't, it looks like Ib. Ib looks like an alien. Fair enough. So we've got many scrum people here. A bit of scrum and Kanban, not so much just Kanban, and a couple of people neither. Okay, that's fine. Helps me understand where you are. I, what I assume is with this, in this talk that most people come from the scrum context because that's more well understood. Seems like you're pretty representative. Fantastic. So, question two. End of the start countdown. All correct answers give maximum points. What's Scrum for? At least half of you should get this right. But you do have to do some typing. Should have put some music on. I have seen some messages in chat. Um, yes, this is being recorded. It will go somewhere. But I'm not sure where it goes. Mm. 
I want to try the right hand button trick. I'm not. I want to wait for 14 seconds and stop being impatient. Silence isn't my friend. Can you tell? And the answers are done in crim Oh, people like what? So I, I, if you need to know anything about Scrum, there is a wonderful document called the Scrum Guide. And that document has all the answers in it, ish. But it's owned by two people. They write that document. They keep it up to date. You may have even heard it's being updated. And later this month, the new version is being released. Ooh. But that's what it says. Scrum is a framework for developing, delivering, and sustaining complex products. If you are trying to use Scrum for complicated or clear or obvious work, you're doing it wrong. It's not for that. It'll actually make the thing complex by using Scrum. Scrum is not the golden hammer that will replace every tool you've ever heard about that came before it. It's just for one specific use, complex product development and staining of that complex product develop product once you've done it. And it isn't the developing that's complex. It's the product that is complex, the product need. It is the problem that you are trying to solve that is complex or not, not the way you're doing it. Because I'm going to tell you, writing software is not complex. Writing software is complicated. You just have to learn it and become an expert in how to do it. Same with testing and all of those things. If it's a bit like clockwork, it's complicated. You can understand it if you're a sufficient expert. If it's complex, it's an ecosystem of interdependent things with so many different variables that nobody can understand what is going on. And you actually have to do something to learn about it. You have to actually try and solve the problem, hence needing fast feedback. That's why we use Scrum. Makes sense, yeah? So it's just another tool to put in your toolbox but it's very applicable in just the right context. You'll never guess what the next question's gonna be. We're only gonna go into three questions for now. I need to hit enter. All correct answers give maximum points. So all you need to do is get my definition of what Kanban is for. When I say mine, it's not mine. It's the one I'm using. And it's provided for you in a free book. And I'm going to give a plug to this free book because it's awesome. It's called Essential Kanban Condensed Guide. And you too can download it for free from the Kanban University. It's only 65 pages long and it's written by Andy Carmichael, who I'm meeting again tomorrow for the first time in a while, and David J. Anderson. And it's the best introductory book to Kanban. But it is 65 pages long. But it is everyone's favorite price, free, right? You can spend money on it if you buy a physical copy from Amazon, though, apparently. And I think Andy would say thank you very much for that. Oh, sorry, what was the name of the book again? Essential Kanban? Essential Kanban Condensed. Condensed. I'll put that in chat. OK. Kanban is a method for defining, managing, and improving services that deliver knowledge work. So it doesn't tell you how to deliver anything. There's nothing in that sentence tells you how you should go around delivering something. It tells you it can define how you currently deliver that service, how you can manage that service, and how you can improve your service delivery. It is an improvement method. Scrum is a delivery framework. Kanban is an improvement method. They are not alternatives. They are of completely different genus. They are for different purposes. Dan, Go for my it. Hand, my hand is up. Um, so you, you said that Kanban was an improvement method there. Uh, I remember a while back there was a distinction. People used to talk about uppercase Kanban, the change method, and lowercase. Uh, seemingly yeah. more delivery oriented. So I wondered where that fits in your comparison. So capital K Kanban and lowercase k Kanban. So capital K Kanban is the Kanban method as defined by David Janderson in the Kanban University. So what most people talk about in the 
agile world, meaning Kanban is usually the Kanban method. That's certainly what I teach on my Kanban classes, for example. Kanban with a lowercase k defined is talking about Kanban systems, which is what we see in lean manufacturing work. And it's these pull systems. Now, the Kanban method makes heavy use of Kanban systems, but there's a real important distinction. You can't just take what works in manufacturing and apply it to knowledge work because the domain is different. Machines on production lines or people working on production lines tend to do the same thing repeatedly. That is the manufacturing model, whereas what we do in knowledge work is service delivery. Someone has a request, some dark arts happen, and then something's delivered at the far end of it, and they acknowledge receipt of that thing. Whether it's whether they say thank you or not, or that solves my problem or not, is a separate issue, but they acknowledge that something got delivered because they asked for something. That's the service model. Manufacturing models tend to have more predictable, less complex work. Knowledge work tends to be complex, therefore does not work with manufacturing models. If you try and take stuff from the manufacturing model and apply it to knowledge work, you may run into trouble. The Kanban method has basically taken a subset of what worked from lean manufacturing, the bit that would work with complex knowledge work delivery, and made that available to us all. So that's what that's there for. And you don't have to pay anybody's fees to go and use Kanban. Just like Scrum, it's offered free. You just got to know what it is and do it. In fact, there's only 12 things in Kanban, six practices and six principles. That's all I teach in my, my Kanban classes. It's then the application of those that where it gets interesting. So Kanban's production line, is it? No, so Kanban systems are what we see that we use in lean manufacturing. So the two uh, bin system or the cards going in racks. And um, we often refer to it as just in time in the UK. Yeah. So if you come across a factory with just in time, that's what you'd see called a Kanban system in Japan. But the Kanban method uses that, but there's a bit more to it. A bit more to it is a very small way of saying there's quite a lot more to it. Okay, I'm just going to uh, move us on. And boom, let's see the leaderboard. Oh, look at everybody there in a thousand. <laughs> okay, the leaderboard might not be useful. So Scrum is a framework for developing, delivering, and sustaining complex products. Again, that's definitive what Scrum is. It's like in the first paragraph of Scrum Guide. What do we mean by framework? These are two photographs of the same car. They are both a Rolls-Royce Silver Ghost Alpine Eagle. The one on the left looks like how it left the factory-ish. They've added some cheeky elements to it, chairs. The chairs wouldn't be there when it left the factory. But back in the day, Rolls-Royce was not a car company. They were an engineering company. So when you brought their cars, that's what they gave you, the framework of a car. You would then get that framework taken to your family's preferred coach builders, and they would then put the rest of it on. You know, the, those luxury items like the doors, the chairs, the, the, you know, the roof, the, the cowlings around the engine, all of that additional stuff that we go to make of as a car. And that's how Scrum is. Scrum doesn't give you everything. What it does is give you a framework. So if you liken it to this metaphor, it's got the wheels, the brakes, the steering, the suspension and the stuff that makes it go forward the engine try having a car without one of those elements and see what happens if you try and use scrum without all of scrum there's a part of the scrum guide called the end note which tells you well beware you can use elements from this guide in isolation from the others but you may even have success if you do that but please don't call it scrum don't try part of Scrum and then say Scrum doesn't work here. If you're going to say Scrum doesn't work here, at least try all of it first. Don't try and do bits of it. And that's where Scrum gets hard. And Scrum is meant to be hard. It's meant to be easy to understand, but difficult to implement because it's meant to show up the problems you have in your organization. And they're not going to be easy. That's why that Scrum Master has that accountability for removing impediments to the team being able to deliver stuff. It's because the impediments... This is where the Scrum Master spends their time. It isn't working with the team and doing the uh, the daily maintenance and all those things. It's working with the organization to remove impediments so the team can do their thing. 
that's typically where scrum masters end up spending most of their time and i'm going to quote jeff watts here a good scrum master can work with several teams a great scrum master can work with one that's why they're busy trying to fix the organization we need scrum masters to do that so in order to make a method based on Scrum, you take that framework and you need to add the seats and everything else. So you might need things like a definition of done. Again, you don't have to have it, but you probably would want one. Um, a working agreement is a really good idea. If you've got a team or a bunch of people working together, having one of them. You probably want to have some strategy around deployment, whether that's code or not code. Now, I did a lot of Scrum and Agile work with non-IT teams. And I'm going to tell you, if you're working in, in non-IT, all of this stuff that special, makes software development special isn't. All software development is, is writing a document in very precise language. The fact that it's written in C sharp or pick a language is neither here nor there. You can write documents in English in legalese in Microsoft Word that are equally as technical or in fact, maybe even more technical. You have to have more skills to be a contract lawyer con doing contracts, right? That's why they have all those long degrees. Um, I'm not saying um, software development is unskilled. It absolutely isn't. I used to do it for a living. I know exactly how skilled you have to be. But it is just writing a document at the end of the day. It's nothing super special. So there are things you should do. Scrum doesn't say you have to have a task board, by the way. Nothing in Scrum says you should. Probably help. And as a Kanban guy, I can tell you, if you have visual management, things go better. But you don't have to. This is why it is a framework, not a fully formed method. It understands you need to tailor it for your context. But those tailor, the tailoring you make is additions, not subtractions. Please don't take the brakes off your car. That will go badly. Again, these are examples, not a checklist. These aren't the things you need to do. There are things you need to do. You will know what they are because you work where you do with the people you work with. What about Kanban? Well, Kanban is for defining, managing, and improving services that deliver knowledge work. So it's a knowledge work-based improvement method for improving service delivery. The outcome you're aiming towards with Kanban is more fit for purpose. You want your service to be more fit for purpose for those customers. Turns out if you have a service that's really fit for purpose for the customers, you get more customers. If it's not fit for purpose, you tend to lose customers. We've all been uh, subscribers to services that we no longer subscribe to, I, I assume. And you probably have your own reasons for dropping off using those services. The easiest one I always come back to is pizza delivery. Remember back in the day when you used to have to phone somebody and they'd make a pizza and that pizza would be delivered to you at your house? Remember those days before apps? You have fitness for purpose criteria. You're all thinking of the first one right now, aren't you? It's the number. It's how long between when you hang up and the pizza arrives. What's your number? Anyone? What's your pizza delivery number? You did, did you really minutes. think oh, you're just going to get away with only me talking here? 20 minutes. Whoa, you live in the city. <laughs> Anyone else got a different number? I don't mind how long, as long as it's when they say it will be. So I like the predictability. Oh, you, you, so you have experience of somebody on the phone telling you how long it'll be before your pizza gets there without directly asking. Yeah, and that's all right, <laughs> as long as it shows up when they say, right? But they usually don't, is my point. They very rarely do. The apps do but they don't on the phone because they're, now that you've uh, held them to a promise. You've asked them for a promise and now they've got to deliver to that promise, right? Because you're going to get upset and not use them again if you don't get that promise. But you also have other fitness for purpose criteria. So you've got your number, but you've also got the, it should arrive hot. That fair? It should arrive, it should be a decent quality. So that might be reasonably fresh ingredients, enough toppings, the right pizza, they don't forget half your order. You've got all of these fitness for purpose criteria. And if they don't meet them, as a customer, what do you do? Go, go again. 
You don't use them again. Yeah, that's it. Do you even tell? I mean, very few people leave negative reviews. I'm going to be honest. <laughs> but the ones who sometimes you get a negative review, but many you get the customer doesn't come back because the service was not fit for purpose. And the fact that we don't bother telling them what fit for purpose is, we assume they should know, is neither here nor there. Now, think about the service you offer to your customers. Do they make clear what they need, what fit for purpose is? Do you ask them? If not, good idea, right? If you have a shared understanding of fitness for purpose for the service that you're offering them, you've got a hell of a lot more chance of meeting their expectations. And even if you know their expectations are unreasonable, at least knowing them, you know what's going on. If their expectation is 10-minute pizza and you've got no chance of meeting it, you're screwed. Yas wants 20-minute pizza. Imagine my dismay because I have a service level agreement that I've set up that 30 minute pizza. I've even put it on the door of my car, but yes, hasn't bothered looking at it. And so I've delivered a pizza in 25 minutes to him and he's like, it's five minutes late. And I'm congratulating myself for being five minutes early. I'm wondering what's going on with my tip. You often end up with these mismatches. Understand that seriously, it really matters. Anyway, I'm gonna stop being teacher and move on. Anyway, Scrum is delivery. Kanban is improvement. If that's the one thing you take away from this, this talk, you've got something really valuable. They're different and for different things. Because they're different, they work together well. Scrum tells you how to deliver complex products. And it says you should improve. It says, hey, you should be doing a sprint retrospective where you inspect and adapt how you deliver your work. Awesome, we're going to get better doesn't tell you how to retrospective, doesn't say how you should get better or how, even how you should measure it, just as you should. Kanban says, you're already delivering service. Let's describe as actually practiced what's going on in your organization right now in the service that you deliver. And then it tells you, you need to manage for flow of value delivery and you need to limit your work in progress. So it tells you how to improve. And it says implement feedback loops because you need those. And it tells you that you need to get better with small evolutionary change. It tells you all of these things. And it even gives you some nice measures to use to tech. Are we getting better or does it just feel better? Because measures matter. Turns out that 20 minutes of yeses is really important. <laughs> So Scrum tells you how to play the game. Here's some wonderful photographs of some 1980s line outs in rugby. I'm a, I'm a rugby coach. This might come across <laughs> at some point in this class. So I can, this used to be me. I used to be a second row jumping for the ball in the line out. And it used to look like that. As you can see, some of them are soaring a, a massive ooh, 18 inches off the ground. And that's how we used to do it. So Scrum shows you how to play. Kanban shows you how to become fitter for play and improve your game and help the game improve as well. So now you see some uh, modern day lineouts. And if you've ever wondered why they have that strapping around their legs, it's so that you can stick your thumbs underneath them and lift them easier. And I'll, I'll tell you that's about catching the ball roughly 12 feet in the air rather than the aforementioned seven feet. It's a long way up when you're up there. And um, I was very lucky a few years ago to be invited by the, um, the rugby union to a masterclass on coaching. And I got to spend some time at RFU's training ground at Penny Hill Park with the England forwards coach. And he would be absolutely having kittens at some of the thumb and elbow positions of those line out lifters. Because it's all about where you put your thumbs. That's the level of detail they have at that level. Thumbs there, not there. Because it changes your elbow position. Right, rugby coach done. Moving on. That was boring, obviously. <laughs> I miss being in a room and be able to gauge the, the, the tone. Anyway, Kanban gives you some benefits. Dan, High we're all, we're all lifting work. stuff. Can't you see on camera? We're Sorry, all what? Lifting stuff with our thumbs right now. That's why you're not getting a reaction. Ah, uh, there you go. Yeah, I'll not tell you. I, I was coaching juniors at the time, and I took this thumb position knowledge back to them. And I'll not tell you what the line out call they came up with, it, but it involved the word chocolate. <laughs> Kanban benefits include high optionality of work selected. Because we defer commitment, 
You might have heard the term last responsible moment. We defer commitment until the last responsible moment because you should never commit early without a compelling reason to do so. Because we do defer commitment, we have high optionality of what we select next. And that's also a benefit you get from limiting work in progress. You get faster delivery of work items. You get delivery of units of value instead of units of work. I think the worst thing that was ever taught in an Agile class was the idea of breaking things down into tasks. I know this is Dan's view, and many Scrum trainers and Kanban trainers I talk to think I'm an idiot. And that's their right. They're idiots too. If you break things down to task, they become units of work and align to specialisms. And what happens is your specialists start earmarking all of the work for that specialism to themselves. This encourages people to work in parallel rather than working together cross-disciplinary on the problem. So the developer owes us the development, the tester owes us the testing, and the um, op, op, sysops owes us the deployment. No. We're agilists. We work in teams. We all work on delivering that value feature together around one computer. Collaboration around a whiteboard and around a computer, not working in parallel in a close-knit area on separate uh, things with our headphones on. Sorry, isn't that kind of impractical? Because oh. there are developers, there are test analysts, there are yeah. DevOps engineers, and they do specific jobs. You can't okay. test something unless you've developed it. You can't deploy something unless it's passed its test. So, and so how can how can I understand the whole thing about collaboration and doing things like three amigos and all that kind of lovely stuff where you're doing collaborative refinement and all that kind of, you know, good stuff. But it is, you know, it is units of work. It, it is stuff that, you know, people do their specialisms on. You can't get a test analyst to do development. That just yes, doesn't can. work. Yes, you can. No, you can't. Absolutely. Yes, you can. Okay, then. Uh, I, I don't, I don't, no. Okay. I, I Let me put it to you this, Lee. Can you imagine being an ice cream expert and you're trying all these different flavors and you present your latest flavor of vanilla ice cream yes. to the experts? Ice, and cream this, yeah. is ice cream Hold on. Ice cream is ice cream. Developing a software system is developing a software system. You can't compare them. They're okay. apples and oranges. Let me do this. Recently, I worked with a team in an energy sector company where I had geophysicists with multiple PhDs each, where one individual was one of two individuals on the entire planet qualified to work on what she could work on. So that's the level of specialism, and it's far in excess of any software developer on the planet. And I can say, as a mainframe developer on assembly language, I, I was fairly specialist in niche. And I, I, I can say no doubt she was better. By pairing her with a reservoir engineer, which is a completely different but very specialist role that you have to train for about seven or eight years to do, and having them working as a pair, one with the mouse and one with the keyboard, I caused them to be faster, more efficient, and deliver to a higher quality and have more fun doing it. They got more done quickly, more quickly, because they worked together. How? Because experts do the expert thing and repeat. If you talk to an ice cream expert, and this is where I'm going to just bear with for a second, yes. If you talk to an ice cream expert about the vanilla, they'll say, oh, but we can go to Madagascar and get the best vanilla. I would put the actual vanilla pods in rather than essence. If you talk to an idiot who hasn't got any clue about ice cream, what they can say is, you know what I think is a good idea today? Let's put some raw, uncooked cookie dough in the ice cream and see how that tastes. Trust me, an ice cream expert is never going to come up with that in a million years. But someone who doesn't know any better would. And this is the power of the inexpert. You should have pairs or squads or, or, or little clusters of experts and inexperts working together. What the experts do is they lend the safety to not doing something dangerous or stupid. What the inexperts do is ask dumb questions and come up with dumb ideas. This causes the expert to say stuff out loud. And okay, I'm going to tell I, you this. There's I, a lot I, of neuroscience I, I, at play here. Neuroscience tells you the way that your brain works is if you are trying to solve a problem in silence with your headphone on, 
you're using your limbic system. The oldest parts of your brains are developed a long time ago before Homo sapiens. You're not very bright. If you do your thinking out loud around a whiteboard, you're roughly 20 IQ points brighter. So your experts, because they're being come, challenged with dumb questions and because people are coming up with dumb ideas because they don't know better, your experts are having to then engage their communication centers. So not only on the outside parts of your brain, we're crossing both hemispheres and having to tell stories. So if you talk to David Snowden, the guy behind Kinevin, he'll tell you that Homo sapiens is extinct. We are Homo narans, the storytelling apps. But you see, I'm even telling you a story now. I, I, I look. I really want to believe what you're saying. Yeah, it, it, it is the ultimate goal, but it's it's not the same thing. Um, you know, when 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 you're building a software system, you have a customer that has a requirement. Now, if, no. if all things are great, that customer has specified what they want and given you an acceptance criteria for which they, they would say to you, yep, you've delivered to me what, uh, what, it, what it is that I want, yeah? And this is the heart of complex, that's not true. What the customer has given you is their current best understanding of how their need would be met, which is incorrect because it is a complex adaptive problem. A complex adaptive problem means the act of trying to solve the problem changes the underlying problem you're trying to solve. So what? how many times, Yas, have you locked somebody down to what they want, delivered exactly what they asked for, and they've said, uh, can you just, and asked for something slightly different or completely different, or even well, worse, that, said that's it, not what I asked for. It, it, it may or may not be that that customer knows exactly what they want. They that, can't. That, it's fine. complex. But, they know they but, cannot, by definition, know what they want. But the thing and is that's that we're fundamental. In, but we're working in a commercial environment. Yeah, we're we're meeting business need. It's not yeah. just you know here's a piece of software that we're trying to make as brilliant as possible. Yeah, we we are meeting a business need, and yeah. and, and and that need can only be articulated by by the business representative. So no, they're saying they don't know this either. Is the problem that I'm having to. To, 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 to overcome. So th this is the absolute nub of complex product delivery. They don't know what they want. They know the problem they want to solve, but they don't know how to solve it yet. They don't have your technical expertise, so they don't have the opportunities. So we need to work together with them and do sure. something quickly, get fast feedback. This is why the sprint review is so important in Scrum, because this is where we inspect and adapt the thing we did to try and meet that need. Okay. And, uh, and they change their mind. We want them I, to change their mind as quickly as possible. We want them. I, I, I don't. I, I don't want to kind of hog this bit, but you know, it's still it's still difficult to sort of get through my head. Yeah, because it is, and you, it's not you. You've it's, got, you've got, this is the you've problem. Got product, you've got product refinement that you can do collaboratively. Yeah. So I've got a business problem that I need to solve. We'll look at this requirement, and and we will see whether you need some kind of primary development or whether there's systems already there that, that can meet that need that we may need to tweak. That's all part of that. That's all part of that refinement. But at the end of the day, there's a customer who wants something and they tell you, this is what will, this is what I'll need in order to, to accept what it, the product that you're delivering to me. And, and that's and, the commercial environment that we work in. And it, there's so much I want to unpick on this, but it fundamentally comes down to complexity. I'm going to disagree and move on and say, I've seen it many times. I get what you're no saying. Worries. There is not a specialism in the world that does not take advantage from working collaboratively with people who are less expert in that area in the complex arena. And this is why I, I'm really clear what Scrum is for. It's for complex product development, not complicated. If it is possible for what you say, which is that I know if I do this, the need will be met. The problem is not complex. And therefore, you should not be using Scrum at all. In fact, you shouldn't be using Agile. You should be using project management because there's no new information being discovered. No. If you're not discovering new information, no. it ain't complex. No. No. We're going to have an interesting chat afterwards, but I'm going to move us back on because I've seen other people's faces. I think we two people are really interested by this, and maybe one or two more, uh, but I, I get it, so I'm going to move on. But yeah, this is the problem. The reason I get so passionate about it is this is kind of the thing in the whole of the thing, understanding where to use these things and how to use these things rather than just applying them.
So anyhow, validated learning, that's kind of important too. You can't validate learning unless you measure stuff. And I mean measure, velocity is not a measure. And I'm going to say another contentious thing. Velocity is a made-up guess because in complex estimates are guesses. We don't know how to solve this problem yet because we haven't done it. I'll tell you once it's done. It's a bit like a business case. You can't know what will meet the business case until you do it. And then you'll build it and they'll either come or not. So validated learning means real metrics. That means irrefutable measuring of things that actually happened. So what about those two together? Yes, they're not different. Scrum is a team framework to deliver product. Kanban is a service delivery improvement method. So they work together. Coming back to the number of this. If you want to use them together, that's fine. In fact, Scrum is most of the way to Kanban all by itself. But you can also apply it across things. How would you start? Empirical improvements. Start measuring. Measure the elapsed time in days between when you committed to doing something and it was done. That's called the customer lead time. We often refer to that as lead time. There's this whole thing about cycle time versus lead time. I'm going to tell you, there are clear definitions. These are my 10 fingers. These two are called thumbs, but I have 10 fingers. That's a medical definition. It's not up for debate. Doctors said this. It's in doctor's medical notes. Done. These two are special fingers. They're special fingers called thumbs. Similarly, a cycle time is the amount of time between one state of a workflow and any other state in a workflow. So you have lots of different cycle times. So started to done could be a cycle time. The one that is committed to done is the cycle time we happen to call lead time. It's a specific thing. It is a specific cycle time. That means we can start actually measuring how many things we finished, how many things we're working on. Just those three metrics, which are actually functions of each other, means we can start being predictable. It means we can start being in control and we can have a reasonable conversation with our stakeholders without getting beaten up for debt. It means we can start forecasting. And by forecasting, I mean applying maths and models. And the, you can, the easiest way to tell a difference between a forecast and an estimate, or a guess, as I like to call them, is that you can never have a solitary date in a forecast. It's always a range and a probability of lying within that range. It's a bit like a weather forecast. The question we want answered is, is it going to rain tomorrow? What the answer is, between 10 and 11, there's a 20% chance of rain. It's like, well, I have to then apply my own knowledge on top of that. But the forecast is saying between this and this, here's the probability. So when you see date ranges with probabilities, you've got a forecast. If you see a single date, well, Hans Rosling has a very useful quote for you. Hans Rosling from his book, Factful, Factfulness, says, never trust a solitary number. And he's absolutely right. You'll have seen the coronavirus numbers over time. You don't look at individual data points, you look at trends. You'll know this if you've ever tried to lose weight and stood on a scale. Don't celebrate too much when you lose three pounds in a day, because you'll probably put one of them back on tomorrow. Look at the overall trend. Look at moving averages. They are much more interesting. Statisticians never look at individual data points. So you start adding measures, and suddenly we now have a Kanban on top of Scrum Team. And you need a name for that, don't you? If only you could bring those two words together, Jedward style. Are you all thinking of the same name I am? Three, two, one. Canrum. Canrum. <laughs> okay, maybe not. The problem with Scrumban, I hate Scrumban. I'm going to put that out there right now. I hate it because what happened is somebody wrote a book based on a blog, which they wrote as well, which was about a Scrum team that started doing Kanban on top of it. And it was called Scrumban with a hyphen in the middle. And somebody read the title of that and thought, that's a good idea. I'll not bother reading the book, obviously, because that's irrelevant to me. What it is, is obviously half of Scrum with half of Kanban. And actually, the people who did that probably didn't bother learning what Scrum was and probably didn't even learn what Kanban was and put these things that were together. You know, basically, it means the bit of Scrum that we can do here without rocking the board too much with the bit of Kanban that aren't too hard to do. So basically, avoiding the need to change the organization. Why, why did we start doing Scrum and Kanban again? 
Was it because the existing way of doing things worked really well for this complex knowledge work we're doing? Oh, hang on a minute. We need to change. Damn, we missed the point. So I hear that because there is no definition. There's one by the Agile Alliance. Their definition literally makes me want to rip my eyes out. It's so bad. They have a complete misunderstanding of even what Kanban is, but they're trying to use half of it. The point is we need to do that. If you want to do this stuff, I'm sorry, it's a bit harder than you might think. You need to do all of this with all of that. If you're missing the wheels off of your car, it ain't going to drive so well. If you're missing the, drive, the suspension, it ain't going to drive so well. I'm being quite prescriptive here, aren't I? I'm saying if you're doing Scrum, you have to do all the Scrum. By the way, that's not me. That's Ken and Jeff, the, the guys who invented it. It's kind of said, try and do all of it. Please, please don't judge us on half of it. <laughs> and I'm saying, oh, Kanban, actually, you need to do all of it. There aren't any bits I can think of that would make things worse. Doing Kanban without lip, limited whip. Not really Kanban then, is it? Doing Kanban without flow systems. Ah, about that. No pull system. Ooh, that's not going to work. So we need to do those things if you're going to see improvement, if you're going to see change. The things do work together well. So typically you start with somewhere in the middle and you expand left and right. We infect teams, I like you say. And you eventually hope everyone gets involved, even without the space between the words. Sorry about that. But you're trying to go upstream and downstream, as you say in Kanban, and touch the sides, because Kanban's about service delivery. What would be the point of improving the ovens on our pizza delivery service to be two minutes quicker? But in doing so, meaning we have one less driver doing delivery, which means we actually get our pizza 10 minutes slower. But we often do that, where we do a local sub-optimization without regard to the entire end-to-end -end system as the customer sees it. And we make the system worse by improving a little bit in the middle, which is counterintuitive, but mad, but true, because nobody has the purview of the overall end-to-end -end service that the customer sees because it goes across departments. We see that all the time. Point is, we want to care about what the customer cares about. If you want more customers, give them what they need. Just like those single team scrum teams do. You remember that one scrum team that does everything from soup to nuts? You know how Scrum was meant to be implemented? It's almost like that's exactly what they're doing. They've got a service from end to end, all within one team. So you can do small things quickly. That's what Scrum's meant to do. But we're not there. We're here. We're in this multi-Scrum team, non-Scrum team sadness situation. Let's imagine your team two there. Okay? What would that look like in Kanban? Well, let me show you how a Kanban board works. Imagine you're going for a cup of coffee back in the days when you were allowed to. Here you are. There's a queue outside the shop. Then there's a couple of people inside the shop who've made it through the glass door, but they're not being served yet. And I've put the number two next to that, saying there can only be two. Then we take an order. Then we make our payment. Then the coffee gets brewed. Then they do the milk. Then they do the lid. Then the cup sleeve. Then they call out your name. And then you're done. That look about right for the process? Sweet. Okay. I want to point out those things there. All Kanban boards are different. However, all Kanban boards, if they are true Kanban boards, share some characteristics in common. Selected. There's a queue there, like ready or committed or selected, usually one of those three words. That has a whip limit, but no work happens. Then there are pairs of activities and queues beyond. These aren't people. These are not handoffs. These are activities. If I'm going to go and teach them mode, these are the dominant knowledge discovery activities at this state of, stage of the workflow is what goes on there. So it's not a handoff. It's just an activity. This could be a small coffee shop with one person doing the whole thing from start to finish. But it's a pair of that and a queue beyond. Whether you've done, I prefer ready for. So it would be order, doing, ready for payments. Payment, doing, ready for brew. Brew, doing, ready for milk, and so on. I like done being a one word at the end because I'm a scrumist at heart. But that's how we do it. All the way to the last one, there's no point having a ready for done. So we don't have the queue at the end. But the whip limit applies to both the activity and the queue beyond. This forces a pull system. So if you have a Kanban board and it doesn't have whip limits and it doesn't have a pull system, 
I'm afraid you don't have a Kanban board. You've got a visual management board, which is awesome because the first step of Kanban is make it visual. But I've got two really good ideas that will help improve things on that board. Implement whip limits and implement a pull system. So we have those buffer lanes, as we call them. They're the cues beyond each activity. We have whip limits. There are no unbound, unbounded cues between committed and done in a good Kanban system. Occasionally, we start off with them, but we want to get rid of those unbounded cues. The whole system is whip limited. That's what they look like. So what if this is you again? This might be what's going on. You have options selected. One team does this discovery work because they're special discoverers. Another team does the build work. Then another team does the deployment. Another team does SIT test, whatever that means. Then, and actually, they also do the UATT. So I guess that's some sort of super tester team. Just guessing. This is based on a real thing I saw and worked on once. But it could be anything, right? Then it's pre-prod testing deployment done. So that's not necessarily what you have in your organization, but it's plausible, right? Yeah. And your team too, in the middle. Add some work in, why not? And the point is, we are trying to get stuff to done, right? But it's done for us. And we're trying to improve the way we get stuff done. But that's done for us. Who's thinking about the customer in that? Shouldn't we be thinking about getting stuff done for the overall system, overall service? Do you care about the, oven, the pizza being cooked a minute faster? Or do you care about getting the pizza in your hand five minutes quicker or one minute quicker? It's the overall service that the customer cares about. That's where the focus needs to be. And this is what we can do in Kanban is we can start having that as visible one single service end to end, crossing multiple teams. And now we can actually talk together about how we improve that service. So we turn into that, and the little red box is now showing the same team, but it's one big team. We've gone from being the British hockey team to the British hockey team that's part of the British Olympic team. Yeah? We're trying to get as many gold medals for the British public as possible. We have a single service that we're trying to achieve. And that's the view we need to change if you're going to Kanban. Kanban is not a team level method. Kanban is a service delivery improvement method, which means it's a service level method, end to end. That's a bit weird, right? But it's absolutely what it's designed for. I am a bit of an expert in that kind of thing. And take it from me. Come on to class, you'll find out all about it. Advert done. You're all experts. Who can tell me where the bottleneck is? At this point, I'm going to invite us back to Menti for the final question. Who can tell me where the bottleneck is? Okay, are you all back? I'm seeing a few hearts. Fantastic. There's the picture again. Oh, God, I'm, I haven't switched my share, have I? Okay, so I'm sharing my mentee. Who can see where the bottleneck is, right? So there are the columns. Where's the bottleneck? This one is fastest wins. Or shall I share the slide deck again? Would that be better? Yeah, it'd be good to see the board again. So you can see the board. Yeah, that thing. I knew I had a mistake built into this slide on purpose. There you go. So is it selected? SIT deployment in the middle there. SIT test, UAT, pre-prod, or deployment. Where's the bottleneck? We had some Scrum and Kanban people here. You're all experts, right? I'll be honest. This is an evil question to ask anybody. There's only one more evil question to ask, and that's what is Kanban? Because most people don't have a good answer for that already. 12 seconds, the votes are coming. Do you all get to see on your Menti screen the answer? Does it share back to you? Yep, 
Do you get to see that graph? Yeah. We don't have so 10 chance. people got it right. That's probably my highest Sorry. ever percentage. We Why can't. is it a pre-prod? Sorry, what was the answer? Yeah, we can't see it at the moment. Yeah. Why is it a pre-prod? How do we know it's a pre-prod? Because everything is in doing, nothing's in done. Can't allow anything to move along. Yeah. So there's obviously something going on there. It's if you look at deployment, it's empty, it's in starvation, nothing's going on, and nothing can get past pre-prod. Because of that, we might want to do some things. Can I just rewind? And I'm going to show you the Starbucks example again. Now you know how to look for them. Where's the bottleneck? This is an out loud question. Prep milk. Prep milk. Yeah. And I will tell you, that's always the bottleneck in a coffee shop because you will want different milk at different temperatures with different formulas. Whether you, even if you say semi, stay semi-skimmed, you've got cappuccinos, flat whites, lattes, and then the odd weird person wants just an espresso with no milk at all. They get to jump the queue. They probably have a different class of service. But anyway, tea certainly gets a different class of service. But um, it's usually the milk, you know, adding the almond milk and soy milk and so on. It's always the milk. And in this example, what's actually happened is my little coffee shop's run out of milk because we only have a little shop. That's why I can only get two people through the door and um, run out of milk. So there's someone's had to go to the fridge downstairs and get some more. Look what's happening further upstream. Brew coffee in payment. I can have up to four things in brew coffee, but three of them are done. They've got coffee in the cup sitting. Why don't I want to take any of those payment done cups and move them into brew coffee? What would be the problem if I did? Well, the coffee would be sitting there getting cold. Boom. The coffee gets cold, the crema disappears, the quality drops, I've got rework or I lose customers. So this whip limit of four on brew coffee is protecting the milk bottleneck. It's protecting us from doing anything bad. So rather than brewing any more coffee, I might have to change my activity. Even though I'm an expert coffee brewer, I'm looking at you, yes. Even though I'm an expert coffee brewer, I might be impelled to go and help out on the milk problem, even though I'm an inexpert in milk, because a little bit of help at milk is more valuable to my end customers than doing more coffee brewing that I'm an expert in. That's only going to sit and get, get cold anyway. Does anyone else understand technical debt as unfinished work as well? So this yeah. is the point. It causes us to behave differently and causes us to collaborate. Because we understand that we, we it's only about getting customers out of here with coffee that matters, we then protect our real bottleneck using whip limits. And that's what whip limits are for. Whip limits are like corsets. Now, a corset is an article of clothing that any gender can wear. It's not a basque, it's a corset. It's different. And what it does is it moves stuff from where it naturally accumulates to where you'd prefer to have it. So if I was a politician at an election, I might wear a corset to move my belly fat around my back where you can't see it. However, if I wear it really loosely where it's not causing any discomfort, it's not going to cause any value either. In order for a whip limit to do anything effective, it must cause discomfort. If you have whip limits which aren't being used, in other words, you have a five, but you've only got three things in there, you don't have a whip limit. You've got a decoration. Whip limits are designed to cause discomfort, to move stuff from where it naturally accumulates, here it would be at prep milk, to where you prefer it accumulated, which is before commitment, typically. Kanban systems, we want the bottleneck to be at the start, not the end. So let's go back to where we were. Uh, sorry, can I ask a question about the bottleneck? Yeah. Uh, on this graph, does it also depend on the time that snapshot is taken? For instance, yeah. deployment maybe was done just five minutes ago, three of them already moved. So oh, God, in yeah, that absolutely. case, maybe pre-board have them. So don't we need to have a flow of this board to decide where the bottleneck is? Yeah, but I'm seeing that the work is being blacked up. If I'm looking at SIT tests and SIT deployment, and even build, I can see we're, we're not getting much work done at the moment. We're not doing much work because stuff's waiting in queues, and the whip limits are stopping us taking in new work, even though we could take more build work out of discovery. So I'm seeing pain starting to happen, and I'm looking to where it's happened, and that last column there tells me that's the problem. And that's where I'd go and ask questions first. I'm not assuming... That's going on. The only way I can assume it is because I 
drew this picture. <laughs> but no, that's where I'd start with my questions. But we are protecting the bottleneck is the point. So here it's pre-protesting. So we need to get involved with that. We need to roll our fingers up. I can test. I might not be as good as a proper test engineer, but I can run a test, uh, autom uh, automated test, and look at the results. My favorite thing ever on a, on a build server, I think it was, a, it was a CI server at one of the government agencies I worked at, and it had one of those blocks of red and green, you know, the ones I'm talking about. And there was one block that was red, and someone had just took a sticky note on the monitor saying, this is okay. <laughs> which I thought was the best thing I ever saw on a build monitor. But there you go. It's okay. <laughs> and you have another, so, another question has appeared in chat. Uh, Darwin, I'll read this out if you don't mind, but obviously do oh. add, add to it. Uh, why is it best to have a bottleneck at the start of the board? Have you ever seen that wonderful quote, understanding grows? Scope doesn't creep, understanding grows. This is again part of complex products delivery. When you try and do something, you know that thing that you thought was going to take you five minutes? You hadn't realized when you thought it was going to take five minutes that it's touching that bit of the code base where angels fear to tread. You know the one, the one everyone's just like, oh, don't do that. Or the one where you need that one person, that only single individual that can do something in that area of code. You know what I'm talking about, that you see that happening all the time. It's a repeatable pattern. And suddenly it's gone from being a five minute task to being a two day task. Understanding grows. And this is because we're doing knowledge discovery activities. Every step in that workflow is a dominant knowledge discovery activity. We are discovering knowledge. As we discover knowledge, things tend to grow. It's very rare you discover knowledge that suddenly makes it really easy. That's why it's notable when it happens we all get very happy. Mostly work grows. So you need lots of slack in the system. You need underutilization. 30 to 60% is the cheapest in the real workplace, not planned, actual, 30 to 60% utilization. And you want to bring the bottleneck to the point of commitment. That means we keep the number of things committed to as small as it can be, which delivers things as fast as they can be done. And this is where it gets counterintuitive, that if we say no to stuff, it gets done faster than if we say yes to stuff. And that's because lead time shortens with WIP. Now, I'm saying all sorts of very counterintuitive and weird things that I explain properly in a class where I've got a bit more time and I wear I'm stealing your time already. But hey, it's your time. You can always log off. And <laughs> if you didn't, if you weren't interested, that's fine. Two feet work. But um, here's the truth. As lead time increases, so does effort. I'm not saying small things take less effort than big things. I'm saying as the lead time elapsed, on doing a piece of work increases, it takes more effort to do that thing. Have you all written a performance review document for yourself at some point in your life? Even if you're a contractor, at some point in your life, you must have done them, right? Now, there are typically two kinds of people. Let's use a uh, chat burst. I would like you to type in your answer, either A or B, and not hit enter till I say now. So get the A or the B in there as soon as you're ready, but only hit enter when I say now. Type A, people, when it comes to writing this document. I'm going to allocate like an hour on Monday, an hour on Tuesday, an hour on Wednesday, and an hour on Thursday, and then it'll be done. But I'm going to have a little bit each day because I'll never get a big block. And then type B. It's due when? Oh, crap. I'll get it done in one big block because it's already late, probably, or it's due tomorrow. A or B, go now. Ah, funny that. And I know there are C's and D's and so on, but typically where I'll be. Those B's, I'm talking to you. Any of you feel guilty because you're not a type A and you wish you were? You feel like A is better. Anybody? It's, it's fairly common. And I'm going to tell you this. B is closer to the best answer because I'm going to tell you what type A is like. Type A is like this. Monday, you find the document template eventually and you start filling it in. Then someone either distracts you or you run out of your time box and you move on. You're done for today. It's Tuesday and it's come to the time to pick up that performance review. What's the first thing you got to do? Well, you got your transaction cost. You got to find it and open it. Might take you 10 seconds, might take you two seconds. How many people work in your organization? How many people are doing these performance reviews twice a year, taking 10 seconds each? 
multiply that out and see how many people you're employing to find an open document. It's terrifying. But anyhow, put that to one side. What do you do once you've opened the document? Anybody? Try to remember where you left off. Yeah. So you try to remember, and how do you do that? How does that become transparent? Uh, someone's put read what you put yesterday. Yeah. So you reread it. Then, are you the same human as you were? Are you the same person today as you were yesterday with exactly the same thing going on in your head? So what do you do next after you've reread it? Check email, apparently. <laughs> yeah, that often happens. Task interrupt, then you've got to do your relearning overhead again. And now what do you do? You've done your rereading and you change it. We refactor in coding terms, but yeah, you make it better, right? Because that was crap, wasn't it? Yesterday, well, I wrote yesterday. Oh, I was an idiot then. So you rewrite it. Once you've finished doing all of that, you finally add some more work and close it because your time's up and you've got another email. And guess what you do on Wednesday and Thursday and Friday? You have to go through those relearning overheads and rewritings multiple times. Now, the thing is, the rewriting does add quality probably the first time is where the most quality gets added with a diminishing return over the week. So if you're a type B, do it a day sooner, do it in one big block, then overnight, sleep, come back in the next day, reread it, rewrite it, close it, have your meeting. It'll take the least effort to do the same thing. It will be of probably better quality because you've got to focus and so on. And I'll ask a further question just to see if you're like other humans I know. If you are a type B, do you do it at your desk or somewhere else? Do you write your big, it's due tomorrow or it was due yesterday document at your desk or somewhere else? This is assuming not COVID. <laughs> Anyone going to tell me where they do it? Somewhere else. Yeah, well, hide in the office, work from home. Why? No distraction. Yeah. Your desk isn't where you get work done. Your desk is where you get distracted. Your desk isn't where you achieve stuff. Your desk is where you get interrupted and distracted. And you know that. That's why you hide in the office, take your laptop to a little out-of-the-way meeting room or something, or a little coffee place or something like that, and do it there or do it from home. We know this. Um, I remember working at one of the largest banks, a different one this time, and the head of design, one of the most beautifully turned out men I've ever met in my entire life, used to put on the crappiest little red baseball cap when he was doing stuff he couldn't be distracted with. And it was a rubbish one. It really was the cheapest of the cheap. You know, like 50p was over much for that hat. But he put that on and it meant, unless the world's ending, I'm busy. Just let me finish this. I've got to do this thing today. And it was very simple. And he's like, yeah, okay, I'll come back. Because it wasn't going to end well if he did distract him and the world wasn't ending. So it, stuff like that. So what I'm saying is, with increased lead time, you've got more relearning overheads. If you're pairing, where's Fred? Oh, Fred's busy on that other thing now. I have to wait till Fred's available. Then Fred becomes available, but I'm now busy on something else. Oh, crap. That's a problem. Um, or Fred's off sick today. Or Fred's in a meeting. He's gone to the dentist. All those things happen. Coffee breaks happen. And that means you've got to come back. You, or you go to lunch or you go to the toilet. All of these interruptions happen more times over a longer elapsed time. If you can shorten the lead time, those things happen less. Your distractions happen less. You're more able to focus. It also means you probably have people who aren't expert in the room with you, asking things, making you do your thinking out loud, which makes you think you're going slow, but actually makes you a lot more intelligent and increase the quality. And again, this has been measured. I'm not just saying it, I promise. <laughs> you should see what happens in a CAT scanner when you try to do problem solving in your head versus out loud. It's amazing the fireworks that go off in the CAT scanner when you're actually starting to communicate. You're just brighter when you're communicating. Whiteboards are where you do the solving. And yeah, you just see this stuff over again. So if you can shorten your lead time, you get more stuff done more quickly, which means you've got to ruthlessly prioritize, which means you're working on the highest value thing and getting the value and the feedback as quick as you can. Therefore, you've got earlier value, earlier feedback, which means the customers change their mind more quickly because they're doing complex work, which means you spend less time doing the wrong thing, which means we now can do the next thing that's made at the top of our ruthless prioritization and get that value as quick as possible. Therefore, you get not only does each piece of value come quicker, you're more focused on the highest value thing, but you get more things done because each thing takes less time. 
it's a bit of a virtuous circle, this Kanban thing. I'm, I, I'm trying to not sound like a sales guy, I promise. <laughs> it's just like, this is what it does. Anyhow, where was I? PowerPoint. Yes, you could see where the bottleneck is. So let's all help out then. We all need to help out on the bottleneck because that's what the customer needs us to do. It's not about me doing work. It's about the customer getting value. And this is another thing with tasks. When you measure work tasks, the unit of work is what is valued. Therefore, we try and get more work done. When you deliver, focus on the value, the unit of value as your work item, then the focus on getting more value delivered. It's a subtle but important change. The team are responsible for delivering the value. The development team are responsible for delivering the value. Sorry, at what point do you start measuring lead time? At what point? Did you do like, it yesterday? For example, on, on, that, on that chart, where, where would you oh, start? Oh, where does it start? At the point you go, you see the yellow dotty lines? Right. That covers it perfectly. So when you go from options to selected, that's the commitment point. The first time you go into that selected, nobody's working on it, but it's committed now. Line until done. That's lead time. That's oh, customer okay. lead time. All right. And and, sure. and what does that what does lead time actually tell you? What 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 is what information do you get out of it? I'm going to be absolutely transparent. It is exactly how long it is since you committed to the customer that you would do it until it got done. But there is a mathematical formula that links stuff in the past that you have done called Little's Law that says your average lead time equals your average whip divided by your delivery rate, which is the amount of things you successfully deliver per day. So it's number of days equals number of things divided by things per day, who would have thought? So in my old UView team, we had an average whip of 5.5 things, limited to six, but we sometimes only had five things on there, 5.5 on average. And we delivered one finished work item every two days. So our delivery rate was 0.5. 0.5 things finished every day. Our lead time was roughly 11 days. 5.5 okay, divided by a half is 11. And am I right in understanding that um, it, it's a trend measure, measure rather than it telling you anything about individual? Exactly. Work. Never look at individual data points. They're... They might be interesting if you've got some variability going on or something going on in a particular team. But in general, never look at an individual data point. Look at trends. Look at how we're getting better. And also, you need to know a bit about maths. I'm not going to go on about it, but if you're looking at mean, arithmetic mean or mean average or equals average in Excel for lead time, you're using the wrong tool. You should be using the median. Arithmetic mean is not equally applicable to all data sets. The data set needs to be symmetrical and lead time on knowledge work never is. It is on manufacturing. That's why you use things like Six Sigma on manufacturing. You don't use that in knowledge work because we have this unsymmetrical frequency chart. Now I have gotten the deep maths, so I'm gonna back out of that quickly because I don't wanna lose everybody and bore them to death. But there is a specific thing going on there. But the point is your lead time and your delivery rate are functions of each other using your whip. So if you wanna increase the number of things you do per day, you need to reduce your whip, which shortens your lead time and therefore will increase your delivery rate. And they are tethered in that order. They are whip and so lead time follows whip and delivery rate follows lead time. As you reduce your whip, you need to flush all of the things out of your system that were at the high whip and, and you'll see the improvement on all the things that eventually get committed after the whip was reduced. And you'll only see the delivery rate improve once those things start getting to the end of your service and get delivered. So there's trailing between those three things. But WIP is your tool. It shortens lead time. Therefore, your delivery rate will increase, often dramatically. And often by not doing a single thing different about how you work, but only changing how you queue work in the middle that you're not working. Now you get rid of the work you're not working. That's all we're doing, Canva. Reduce the queues. So that's the new context. That's what we're trying to improve because that's what the customer cares about. End-to-end -end service delivery. That's the trick with Kanban. Why would you add Scrum to Kanban? Because I've given you lots of reasons to add Kanban to Scrum, which is what most of your context was. But it gives you structure. Those five events, so the sprint, 
sprint planning, the daily scrum, daily Kanban meeting, daily stand-up, if you're doing XP scrum or Kanban, call it what you like, but that daily coordination meeting that would take about 15 minutes, that one. Um, the sprint review where you inspect and adapt the, the, the increment, the thing you just did, and get feedback on a timely basis. Awesome. And the sprint review, sorry, the sprint retrospective, whether you inspect and adapt the people who did the work and get better. Awesome. It gives you that nice little structure, those five events. Uh, it gives you roles and accountabilities. So if you don't have someone who cares to make sure that all of the things you commit to doing in Kanban are going to deliver a lot of outcome, a lot of value, then you just increase your output. You do more stuff. So having someone who's really passionate about making sure each thing we commit to is valuable, like a product owner does in Scrum, means when you deliver more output, each thing delivers more outcome. And it's outcome that we care about in our job. So it all ties together a bit there. And having a Scrum Master, someone whose job is making it easier for everyone to do their thing, that helps. And the role of, I'm the person accountable for delivering this stuff. Therefore, I'll decide how I deliver this stuff because I'm an expert in delivering this stuff and leveraging those specialism and expertise that you do need. And you got some simple artifacts that every team can have the same. Product backlog, sprint backlog, and the increment. Scrum's not hard, 353, three. simple. Gives you the framework. If you don't visualize the whole service, the whole system that the customer sees, you're missing a trick. All you need is a bit of space in a wall or some digital space where you can tie this stuff together. If what the customer cares about is end-to-end -end service, pizza in my hand, that's the bit we need to get better at. So make it visible. And wouldn't it be great if you had somebody accountable for that end-to-end -end service delivery right across the way? They may need to span multiple departments. That might get interesting. If you limit the whip, you shift value from focusing on working stuff to delivering things, getting value delivered. I said manage flow of value delivery. I didn't say manage flow of work. Manage the flow of value delivery out of the system. If your system is a glass ketchup bottle and the work is the ketchup going through it, it only becomes valuable when it leaves the bottle. You can only dip my chips in it when the ketchup's on my plate. So I want to maximize the flow of value of ketchup onto the plate, out of the bottle. So that's the focus we get with Kanban. It's one of the key principles. With whip limits, we can bring the pain forward, away from where the true bottleneck happens, because all too often the bottleneck's at the end of the system, which is the worst place you can have it. You've got all this stuff piling up behind it, and people can't do their thing. It's very frustrating. That's why we put the bottleneck at the beginning, to allow growth, and we want to optimize there's only one column on a Kanban board that adds any value, and it's the last one before done. The job of every other column is to keep that last column with just the right amount of stuff so you can maximize flow through that right last column. If you're making the greatest coffee in the world and you run out of lids and you can't give the coffee without lids, you're not giving any customers any value by making lots of coffee because they're not allowed that cup without a lid on. I've picked a really bad example there, haven't I? But you see, that last column is the important one. It's only when I've got a cup with a lid on I can give to you that there's any value. If you're going to do something, use real metrics. Please don't use velocity. It's a made-up guess about how big or complex something is divided by another very flexible thing. You were probably very young when you learned arithmetic, but it does have rules. The things that you add together must be numbers. Numbers have the law of immutability. Three plus two equals five. Eight minus three equals five. 20 divided by four equals five. There was only one five mentioned. That's the same five used in lots of different places. It's not five equals five. Five is five. There is only one five. Story points aren't like that. You cannot add them together even. Arithmetic does not work with story points. The fact there is a digit representing them is neither here nor there. There need to be numbers to be added together. And divide it by a sprint. What's a sprint? How, how productive were you with this sprint? Did your team have high morale, low morale? Did half of your team go out for a, a night out and sort of come in a day a bit hungover the next day? You know, no sprint are equal. Did you sandbag? Did you work the weekend this sprint? 
these are things that are not immutable. They're not good measures. How long something took is undeniable and is a good measure. How many things we finished each day on average, that is absolutely measurable and undeniable. These are good measures. And by the way, if you say lead time's our measure and we need to make it shorter, shorter is better. By the way, quality is not allowed to flex. The only things you can do is start limiting your whip, which gets the only time down, or start doing smaller things, which means you get faster feedback to the customer, which means they can change their mind faster for less effort, which is valuable. All of the things that you get from shortening lead times and making that visible are good, provided you draw a line in the sense that quality will not drop, but quality should improve. Quality is non-negotiable. So metrics are very dangerous. Only expose the ones that are going to lead to changes in behavior that are positive. Be very careful exposing metrics. The professional scrum with Kanban class. Two days of this stuff, but a bit more applicable. Rather than Dan just says stuff, we kind of explore it and try it. Play games. So that course is available at scrum.org. Um, there are trainers like me who offer it. Or you can go on a Kanban university class. Kanban system design is an awesome class. I love teaching that class. Two days of exploring this and putting it to practice and learning how to apply Kanban to what you do. And what was that one called? Sorry, Dan, Kamb the Kanban University one? Kanban system design. So it's the first two day class. It's part of the Kanban management professional path. So it used to be referred to KMP1. A lot of people call it KMP1, although there's no such thing as KMP1. It's Kanban management professional is a certification which you achieve or an accreditation you achieve after doing two classes. Please don't do them together either. I know some people offer them together, but how much learning are you really going to get from four days of that stuff? Do two days, do some Kanban to learn it properly, then perhaps go back for the second class. And that's where you get the real value. That would be my own personal advice. That's not policy. <laughs> but um, no, I mean, the main thing is give it a go. Get yourself a central Kanban condensed. Start learning how to apply this stuff. Get measuring. When should you start measuring lead time? Yesterday. Today would be better than tomorrow, but tomorrow's as best you can manage. Don't do it instead of velocity. Do it as well as and see which one becomes most useful. Look for a correlation between story point size and velocity. See if you can find one. Um, I'd be surprised if you did.